By the early 70s, the space race had run its course. In 1972, a detente settled in between the United States and the Soviet Union. That meant that the two Cold War rivals, who had spent nearly a generation using outer space as a proxy battleground, had moved on to other things. The American public followed suit. Even pop star David Bowie had had enough. He ditched his glam alien alter ego, Ziggy Stardust, in favor of a new, more earthly persona in the mid-1970s. Around that same time, NASA backed away from a bunch of big projects because of heavy budget cuts and began to focus on developing its space shuttle program. They didn't uh, come up with a gigantic plan that people could get behind because they weren't so afraid of the Russians anymore and they didn't see that point of it and they didn't want to spend billions of dollars doing it. There were, to be fair, more pressing concerns. By the early 1970s, the Vietnam War was limping to an end. An energy crisis was taking root and confidence in American institutions was shaken with the Watergate scandal and eventually President Richard Nixon's resignation. Historian Craig Nelson looks back on those strange few years of the early 1970s, after Americans reached the moon, but before they stopped going there entirely. They kept sending people to the moon, and then all they would come back with were rocks. And they didn't really show what was being accomplished by doing this other than to prove we could do it. And then they started the shuttle program, which was you know, basically a bus that goes to the International Space Station. On a January morning in 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger blew up seconds after liftoff. My controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. Columns of snow-white smoke streaked across a deep blue sky. Krista McAuliffe, a teacher who had spent months preparing to be the first civilian in space, was among the seven crew members killed. President Ronald Reagan summoned all of his oratorical skills that day. Here he is responding from the Oval Office, quoting a poem from John Gillespie McGee, Jr. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning, as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of Earth to touch the face of God. At least for my generation and possibly for people older, too, there was a, a kind of a sense of reckoning or um, or a deflation, you know, of, of some of that optimism. But also soon after that, on the heels of the end of the Cold War and the end of communism, there did seem to be a diminishment of interest in space because of the, you know, the way in which that it did come out of both, you know, scientific curiosity, but also military conquest. On February 1st, 2003, tragedy struck again. Space shuttle Columbia disintegrated as it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. Again, all seven crew members died. At the time of landing, we still haven't heard sonic booms, which precede the landing by a couple minutes. There's no, the skies are empty. And at that point, you know, that, that, that can't, it's impossible. At that point, you've got a missing shuttle. And it doesn't go back into space at that point. You know, it can't keep going around the world one more time. Years later, in 2011, NASA retired the space shuttle missions. By then, for many, the romance of space exploration had ebbed. You could go to the store and buy a computer far more powerful than the one that Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins had used aboard Apollo 11. NASA moved on and began developing a commercial program that would eventually replace shuttle flights to the International Space Station. And in a move that seemed unthinkable 50 years ago, NASA now has an agreement with another country to ferry American astronauts into space. That country is Russia.